All right, good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Glad you're here to join us. Please stand and join us as we sing. We're going to sing House of the Lord. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I will not be, I shall not be greatly moved. We're going to teach a new song to you tonight called My Soul Will Wait. It's right out of Psalm 62. I will. 
Dear God, we're so thankful that we can come here tonight. I thank, I thank you, Lord, for the, the young people who are here for the very first time this evening. I just pray that this uh, will just be a blessing and a, make a difference in their lives. Lord, I pray for all of us as we study your word tonight and as we pray. Lord, I just pray that our, our hearts would grow closer to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. As, as right before the teens and the kids are dismissed, remember this, Friday night, barbecue and bonfire. So if you have an RSVP, tonight is the night. It is your last opportunity. It's going to be a fun, fun time on uh, Friday night. 
All right, looks like you guys have a lot planned downstairs, so I'm gonna let you go. We'll let the kids go, and the teens, you guys can be dismissed. Adults, let's find Mark chapter 10. We are in Christianity Explored. If you have been with us this whole journey, it's been a lot of fun. We've been looking at the message of Jesus really with a fresh perspective, and there are seven main sessions, and we completed six of them. We looked at the identity of Jesus. We uh, looked at some, really, those basic questions about who he was. We talked about what the Bible means when it talks about sin. We talked about the, um, the, the meaning of the cross and the meaning of the resurrection. And what's been really encouraging to me is we've had a, num a couple of people actually here in these classes that are brand new to Christianity, that are um, making the decision to trust Christ as their Savior. They have either recently made that or they have not yet made that. And that's one of the reasons we did that we've done this. And we would like to, yeah, go ahead. As long as the moms that's been coming with her son, they went away with Paul, let us know that they're away. They'll be here Sunday. Yeah. If she wants, so that's, I don't think she knows the Lord. Yeah. But and she's, uh, so it's just exciting to see her coming. And we have, and I want to encourage you, if you are, if you are sharing your faith with coworkers or uh, friends or family member, and they're, they're interested. They, they will listen. We have a whole bunch of resources that we purchased, and one of my favorite ones that I got to give somebody recently is this little Gospel of John. And what I love about it, and if you look in the Resource Center, this little Gospel of John, it, what it has is the, the text of the Scripture, so it's right from the Bible. It's got the text of Scripture, and then it has like a self-guided study program in there where you read it, you look at the comments, you answer the questions, and so we want to be a people that are spreading the good news, right? There's so much bad news and negativity in the world today when we know the answer is Jesus. People need Jesus in their lives. And so we want to be, we want to be spreading that good news. And um, this, this class has been part of it. So seven sessions. And, and toward the end, after the, in between session six and session seven, is this day away. Now, we haven't done the day away exactly how you're supposed to do it. Um, it's an opportunity really for reflection. So I've just broken it up into three weeks. But if you look at the summary, in the last session, day away one, we were looking at our responses to the message of Jesus. So what it is, is it's introspective. And the passage that was taken from Mark's gospel was the, um, the sower and the seed. And we looked at that that story that Jesus told to describe, hey, you can explore Christianity, but the question is, be honest, how are you receiving it, right? And that's something that is between a person and God. And so we looked at the different ways that people respond to this gospel of Jesus. This is an important one that we come to tonight, though, because in this discussion, we learn about two really important factors that are at play in all of life and all of the world, and those are power and humility. The Christian message, the message of Jesus, takes the power dynamic that this world is accustomed to, and it flips it completely upside down, totally upside down. In fact, if you think of a, a non-Christian person um, that, that commented on this, it was Mahatma Gandhi in India. And most of you know about Gandhi and how Gandhi was really, in some ways, a very humble person. And he believed in that power would come through humility, right? When he looked at the teachings of Jesus, and this is an off, you know, an off quoted statement by Gandhi, is he said, I like their Christ. It's their Christians I have trouble with. But he understood that what happens is Christians don't often actually live up to the Christian ethic that Jesus displayed. So whether you're exploring Christianity tonight, I would encourage you, whether you're in here or you're watching, I'd encourage you to judge the message of Christianity, not just by the Christians, because we don't always do a good job. And that's not an excuse, but it's reality. But to actually look at not what a church or a Christian you might have known did or behaved, but what did the master teach? What is the way of the master? And it's and again, it's a way that takes the power dynamic of life and turns it upside down. Are you ready? All right. 
Here we go. I got some nods, I got some yeses, and I got some, some blank stares. But that's okay. We'll go on. So Mark chapter 10, let's read a little bit longer passage. And please do me a favor tonight. As we go through this, start making either mental notes or real notes about your observations. I'm going to read it kind of slowly, and I'd like to go back and have the discussion. I really would like to have some good discussion tonight if we can. So I'd encourage you to be thinking about the discussion or your observations. In fact, let's kind of look at the questions before we even read the text. Look at the first statement there. How would you describe the mindset of Jesus? What about James and John? How about the other disciples? How does Jesus expect his followers to use power? And then we'll come to the last section, compare Bartimaeus. Like, who's Bartimaeus? Well, you'll have to stick around. Compare Bartimaeus to the disciples. So let's be thinking about that. Maybe even take some notes as we read so we can have a good discussion. Mark 10. Pick it up. Middle of the, middle of the action. And they were in the way, going up to Jerusalem. You always go up to Jerusalem because it is seated in a, in a mountainous region. So they're not necessarily going north, but they are ascending in elevation. And Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. So, and, they fought, and as they followed, they were afraid. So Jesus is up ahead, and all the disciples are following behind him. And there's a little bit of trepidation, there's a little bit of fear that's going on right now. Now Jesus, I'll tell you, one of the reasons is Jesus has just made some difficult statements. He told them that it's hard for a, um, do you remember that a couple weeks ago we looked at that rich ruler who was like, hey, what do I have to do to go to heaven? And he said, well, keep the law, oh, I've done it all. And Jesus said, well, there's one thing you haven't done. You didn't sell everything you had. Remember that? That just happened. Also, what just happened is Jesus said to the disciples, hey, it's really hard for rich people to go to heaven. And that just blew their mind. Because in their world, in the world of the disciples, if you were rich, it was a sign of God's blessing. That's what the religious people taught. That if you're poor, you got something wrong with your life. But if you're rich, you must be doing something right. So now the disciples are confused. Jesus is starting to tell them really difficult things. Now look what happens. We come to verse number um, thirty. At the end of verse 32, I guess we're still there. He took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him. Now listen carefully what he says. Saying, behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man, who is he talking about right there? Himself. He's talking about himself. The Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes. And they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him and shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him saying, Master, we would like it if you would just give us whatever we desire. Give us whatever we would like. And he said unto them, What would you like me to do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit. I, you, you know, one of us over here on the right hand, one on the left hand, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be 
among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. We'll read the last verses in just a few minutes. So go back to the beginning now, where we read. You tell me tonight, as we began this, this episode, how would you describe the state of mind that Jesus is in from what you can see here? Would, somebody help me out. How would you describe the state of mind that Jesus is in? I think there's probably several ways we could, we could think about it, but, but d- describe that for me. So there's a sense of, I need to prepare them. And I'm, I'm preparing myself, and I need to prepare them for what's to come. I think that, so what, what's that? Sober and somber. Sober and somber. Yeah, I think that we think of Jesus as always sober and somber. And that would be completely incorrect, right? I mean, he would go to the, the, the festivities and the parties of the day. He was at weddings, I, and people wanted to be with him. So, I, so sometimes people think, well, Jesus was always very sober and somber. But I don't think that was the case. But I would believe in this moment, disciples, there's something going on. Jesus is, there's a mindset of preparation for them. He's sober. He's somber. What else is, and how else would you describe the mindset of Jesus? Yeah. Well, if you say that I didn't come down here to get glory or, or things from you, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to get to that in the, at the, that's toward the, to the end. That's absolutely right. What, what else, though? I think that we could, we could say even more. I mean, what's, what's happening here? Behold, back in verse number 33, Behold, we go to Jerusalem. The Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes. Yeah. That sense of perspective, okay? And that kind of goes with the preparation. He's telling them the things that should happen. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priest. Now listen to, the, listen to this. He's told them before that he would, he's hinted at dying and rising again. Or not hinted, but said it plainly. But look at verse 34. Just read verse 34. And just think about what's happening here. Thoughts on this? Yeah, they're not expecting this. I just think the detail of this stands out to me. The detail really, I think that says something about kind of all of what everybody said so far, is that Jesus is going through this step by step of what's going to happen. Like, I think there's this idea that the cross is, this isn't the distant future. This is right ahead. It's right there. And he says, I'm going to be spit on, I'm going to be scourged. But that word had impact, right? Because they knew what a Roman scourging was. And they said, I'll be spit upon, shall kill him. The third day he shall rise again. What have we seen Jesus so far? Who is the Jesus we know up until now? If, we, if you don't know what's going to happen next, who is the Jesus that you've seen up until now? Yeah. And how is he viewed by people? I mean, he's got enemies, but he's loved, he's adored, people crowd, crowd him. And now he's giving a picture, he's preparing, he's giving a picture of himself that's going to be, that's the complete opposite of everything that they've seen until this moment. He's resolute. He's resolute. I think that's a good word. He describes this, and there's no, he doesn't, he's not trying to get away from it. He's, he's resolved. He's, he's, he's going to the cross. This is going to happen. Now, James and John. It just abruptly goes to verse 35. It's like the conversation doesn't even end, and we come to James and John. Now, how would you describe James and John in this moment? Yeah. I kind of wonder whether they were paying attention. 
<laughs> like, that's a good one. I'm wondering, like, did you hear anything? <laughs> like, like even a little? Like, yeah, are you in another world? Right? What that that's a good 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 point. What else though? So what else? Yeah? don't think they're there yet because that's what you guys, I don't think they are I think I think that's not their mindset at all I think it's the opposite I think like I think like yeah I, I think like Frank said they're like they just did, they didn't hear anything they heard but they didn't listen yeah they're, they're, they're telling Christ what they want yeah we want this we want that so, they, they, got it backwards. they do have it backwards they come and saying Jesus, this is what I want from you. This is what I want from you. Interesting? Like, who initiates this conversation? This is going to be really important. You may want to jot it down. Who initiates this conversation of Jesus meeting the need? They do. They say, what will you do for me? So there's a self-centeredness here, for sure. What else, though? How else would you describe their mindset? Yes, it seems like their definition of success would be what? To be in charge. Well, if I'm in charge, if we are in charge, not only that, but there's a sense of, tr of trying to get ahead of other people. Because who else is behind them? There's 10 more guys. And they're like, hey, Jesus, would you do something for us? but what would you like me to do? They said it obviously loud enough for the 10 to hear, but they come and they try to get in. James and John. Yeah. I never really noticed this, but verse 41. 41? The 10, they're displeased with James and John. There's some division here now. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the next question. How would you describe the other disciples? D division. They're like, what's wrong with these guys? Were they, wonder, were they displeased because they were yeah. they're jealous? Wait a minute. What are these, how come these guys are asking to sit on the right? Why can't we? Or, so you don't think they were pure of heart? Or thinking, were, well, I don't know. Or, or were they some of them saying, I don't know, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe they got a little bit better. I don't think they were pure of heart, actually. I was just trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. <laughs> One of two <laughs> possibilities. Right. And we know even at the Last Supper that Peter says, oh, I would never deny you, or he wanted to fight with the sword at the end. So I'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt, too, that they listened to Jesus and were like, James and John, what are you guys? Did you not hear that? But yeah, I don't think so. What, what, what is the source of their displeasure with them? Where is that? So why are they displeased with them? Yeah, because yeah, they cut the line, they cut the line, they just walked up there and they said, and I think each of them had that same mentality that said, hey, so their view of power and their view of authority is, or their view of success is that they would amass power, authority, and influence to themselves. Have, have things changed very much? Not really. Like, even for all of the talk, like our culture today talks a lot about humility and stuff, but it's still all about front of the line, serve me, look at my post, like my status, feed my ego, you know, all of that, all that kind of thing. So, Let's go here now. So how does Jesus expect his followers to use power? How does he, what is the, so what does Jesus do? I said he flips the power dynamic up. So in, in your own words, how, how does Jesus instruct these guys to use power? To be a minister. To, to be a minister. To serve. 
Now, what would the what would the men, what would the picture here be? Because we have words like we have words that hadn't been invented back then. So we we talk about servant leadership, right? But Jesus doesn't call them to servant leadership. He calls them to be a servant. Be a servant. So the word picture would be like somebody who washes people's feet, somebody who brings the food out, somebody who cleans up the table. This is the idea of, in the society, if you, Jesus says, if you want to be great, then you've got to be a servant. Turns it right around. Jesus expects his followers to use power. Jesus would say, all authority is given unto me. Jesus would say, nobody can take my life. I lay it down. How did Jesus use his power? The ultimate act of service. Let me ask you this. Let's do a little practical part right now. How can you, or how can I, how can we use power as servants? I mean, for real, like just down to where we live. How do we use power and authority in the way of Jesus? Or how do we not? I'll let you go either or. Because all of this is, it's like, what does this actually look like in a Christian's life? If you're a follower of Jesus, what does this actually look like? Yeah, right. Seeing a need, meeting the need. But what is it? So, so what would power be in that case? What would the power or authority be? Well, it could be economic, like the rich young ruler who yep. needs to go sell his stuff and give to the poor. Right. It could be that. That's exactly when Lane said that. That's exactly what I thought. It could be with financial resources comes power in our society. Would you not agree with that? It gives you power and a measure of authority because you have money to buy. It's about earning a living and then taking some of that and using it to help those that don't have it. Yeah. The same earning power. Right. We, those that are very conservative, as you know, many Christians are very conservative politically. We love those passages of Scripture. If a man doesn't work, then he shouldn't eat. You know, we, we hear that. Like, you know, we've got a good, strong sense of a capitalist economy. But what about those verses that do talk about, hey, if you see a brother or sister that's destitute, they're in need, and you withhold, and you say you have the love of God in your heart? So there's a form of power that is money. In the, in the teachings of Jesus, our power is to be used for the benefit of others. Interesting, right? What else? What's, what's another power dynamic? So if you have a cup of water and give to someone. In my name. In my name. Yeah. What's another power dynamic? I, I would say one thing. You, you should go out, you should witness the people for Christ, but then your life has to be exemplary. Yeah. Or it's all for God. That's true. Absolutely. Somebody give me another power dynamic. We talked about a power dynamic of money and how Jesus would have us do that. What's another power dynamic that we have in our lives? Love. Love, okay. Let me give you another one. Like in a marriage. Yep. So you may surrender some of your ambition, right, for the good of your family. Both a man or a woman could say, well, I have this ambition. I could, I'm capable of doing. And the world would say, if you have these capabilities, then you need to, you know, I mean, it's a balance here, right? Because God has gifted us. But at the same time, the skills and the abilities we have should be deployed for the good of other people. The husband and wife dynam power dynamic, right? Like the Bible, the, like the, under the Christian marriage ethic, the, the, the husband is the head of the home, and there's a measure of authority that he has in that home. Is the husband using that, that authority for the benefit of his wife? Or the parents? Are they using that power that they've been given for the well-being but in a lot of ways, 
the people that we love in our life, we, we can all be guilty of this, we ex- not in the worst ways, hopefully, but in more acceptable ways, we exploit people in our lives for our own benefit. And wives have a degree of power over their husbands, though it may not, not necessarily in the, in the, the order in the home sense, but if you're married, you know that women know that they have a, a, a type of power over their husband that they can use either for the benefit of, of him, for, to bless him or not. Same with the children, right? These are power dynamics at play. What other power dynamics exist in, this, in the world? Because remember, Jesus' message here is not just like for while you're sitting in church. I mean, this is like he wants to trans the way of Christ is completely, completely upside down to the way of the, to, to our natural way. So, what's another power dynamic at play? I, I would say, yeah. If you're in a in a position of authority in the workplace, how many of you have ever had a boss? And you think back over the time you've ever had a boss that you said, you know what? I really believe that that person I worked for. He or she had my best interest in mind, 100%. How many of you have ever worked for somebody like that? Wow, that is really cool. I have too. But how many of you have worked for, have, have had two bosses like that? <laughs> Nobody. I mean, just, what's that? 90%. Oh, they were close. They were, they were pretty close, yeah. That's funny, because a lot of people's hands went up. They said they had one, but a lot of people, no, I didn't see anybody that said, yeah, there were two people in their life. So we know it when we see it. We know it when we experience it. And it's the way of Christ. The, the, any other power dynamics that you would think of? Yeah, government. The Bible says that the government is the ruler has been given that authority by God. And sadly, very few times in history have governments truly, have leaders truly acted in the best interest of their people. It's pretty rare. Pretty rare. And we ought to be careful as Christians in the political climate of our day. Because the political climate pushes power, power, power. And there's a right way for Christians to govern and a wrong way for Christians to govern. Um, you see, I think good examples of this are Joseph. Joseph in the Old Testament, as he, became in, as he acted in the benefit of the people of Egypt. You see Daniel and the position that he was given. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because there's a humility, right? There's got to be, that's what Jesus is teaching. And you're, whatever gifts we have and whatever power or authority we're given, Jesus said, this is given to serve. And, and I think one of the miraculous things about the Bible, that's that, about the, the Gospels, that's probably, you only notice this when you read bigger chunks. Like if you just stop and then pick up and then stop and pick up. But if you take some time to read a few chapters at once, you start to see things are connected. So like after this discussion, Jesus says in verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto. Sorry, James, if you could pick it up now in verse 46. Yep. And they came to Jericho. And he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people. Blind Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side, what? Begging. We go from 12 men who wanted power and authority to a disabled man sitting by the side of the road begging. Right in the middle of Jesus' discussion about serving. Accident? Happenstance? Of course not. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, something happened. Bartimaeus has heard of Jesus. 
he said, who's coming? It's Jesus. Who is coming? It's Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth. When he heard that, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David. What did the blind man see that many people hadn't seen in that statement right there so far? What did Bartimaeus see that other people hadn't seen when he said, Jesus, thou son of David? He saw what? Yeah, he saw that Jesus was what? When he says son of David, he's saying, Jesus, you are what? You are Messiah. He knows it. He's blind. He hasn't seen Mary. He's just heard. He's heard about Jesus. And he says, Jesus, he says, son of David. Now contrast this to what the, what James and John said. Do you remember what James and John said? They came to Jesus and they said what? What did they say? Will you what? Will you do something for us? Will you do something for us? And this guy, and then what they ask is quite pretentious, right? Or pres- not pretentious, quite presumptuous. And Bartimaeus is totally different. He says, son of David, and what's the word, what's the, the statement he makes? He asks for what? Just have mercy on me. I don't deserve it, but would you please consider having mercy on me? And many told him to shut up. Be quiet. Hold your peace. But he cried the more a great deal. (laughs) This guy's got, you know, some attitude. You be quiet. You be quiet. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. He says louder. Did he hear me? Did he hear me? Have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still. He said, bring him to me. Bartimaeus, Jesus wants you. They bring him. Be of good comfort. Rise. He's calling for you. And he, casting away his garment. There's there's a bit of faith, I think, in that. He's blind. He casts away his garment. And he comes, he, he rises, he comes to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What would you like me to do for you? Do you see the difference? You see it? They say, Jesus, would you do something for us? Jesus says to Bartimaeus, what would you like for me to do to you? And he says, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately, and immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. You see, these guys wanted glory, they wanted power, and Jesus said, that's not my way. My way is, uh, is taking the very lowest, the person who knows that they have nothing and need everything, the person who comes humbly, and Jesus says, I will do something amazing in that person's life so the introspective part of this like last week we looked at the types of seed you cannot come to jesus with a list of demands it doesn't work and there are many people that they they look at they're interested in jesus for the wrong reasons they might know somebody and say well they look pretty successful and they're a christian So maybe if I come to Jesus, I will be successful like they are successful. Or they'll say, well, they have such a nice family. Now, many of these things are benefits or byproducts of living lives of obedience, right? But they are simply the, they're the fruit, they're not the root, right? If a person comes, and many people have come and they've visited churches for a while, or they've read the Bible for a while, or they've begun praying for a while, or they've They've approached Jesus for a little while, but pretty soon they realize, oh, this isn't all about me. This isn't all about making me feel better. This isn't all about me being wealthier and healthier and wiser and and all those things. 
And churches do good things like financial seminars and marriage seminars and all these good things that help people. And I'm for all of those things. We do them. We will continue to do those kinds of things. But we must never forget that coming to Jesus is not, well, what can you give me? But it is, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And when, you get, when we get to the place where we can say, have mercy on me, then Jesus says, well, what would you like me to do? But it begins with that humble heart. Do any of you have any closing thoughts or comments or questions on, the, on this tonight before we, before we wrap it up? All right. Amen. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and we will go to our prayer time tonight. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you that we've had this time to study your word together. I pray that you'd help us, to, to those of us that are following you, we have trusted you, would help us never to forget that your way is the way of humility. Help us to use the influence, the power, the authority we've been given for the good of those that we encounter. And Lord, I pray for, for our friends that are, they're, they're, they've not yet made the decision to truly follow you, to be saved. I pray, Lord, for them that they would see that, that your love for them is great. God, help them to see your love. But God, I pray that you'd convict them and give them that humility they need to truly receive you. So we thank you again for the, your word and our time in it. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so glad that you've taken the time to join us today. If you've been blessed by the message, or if you have placed your faith in Jesus today, we want to hear from you. Maybe you still have questions about what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Please let us know, and we would love to answer those questions from the Bible. We would also be happy to provide you with the Bible and other free Christian resources to help you grow in your faith. You can email us at info at mountgraylockbaptist.com or send us a message on Facebook. You can also call us at 413-662-2107. We would love to hear from you, and our desire is to be a blessing to you in any way that we can. God bless.